you know the book End of Work. Rifkin. Rifkin, yeah. Yeah. Jeremy Rifkin said Madagascar, certain islands produce vanilla flavor. It's yeah. one of the most popular flavors for ice cream and candy, and uh, <clears throat> they get about twenty-five dollars a pound for vanilla. But it takes a lot of nurturing and work. So some scientific group began to make vanilla, synthetic vanilla, same atomic structure. And uh, they can make it for like three dollars a pound, as against twenty-five. That's going to wipe out all the island survivors, the farmers, you understand, in Madagascar. It's going to wipe out all those people. And there are always people that think that they won't be wiped out because they're the managers. Well, Japan is making program managers and program sequences of car production. And they get all the workers together to work as a team. And they move the machines at a certain speed. And they pick it up a little to get the guys working faster. So the guys complain. So if they complain too much, they can. And uh, so they keep running the machines faster until a person slows up. And when he slows up, there's a light that blinks at his station. So the other guy says, pick it up a little. And so a lot of stress in Japan, emotional stress, because they work them continuously. They order them. And it's teamwork and they love the company. And after hours they have company dinners and company affairs, so the family hardly ever sees the members of the family. And years later, after they retire, they usually degenerate because they have no, they've been worked to the limit. They have no hobby thinking or anything else. And they're lost without the company. Do you understand? The psychological problems. The company is like their family more. Yeah, than the company their pushes and shoves to see how much they can get out of them. Um, so what you have to remember is that the company will not succeed unless it's faster than General Motors, better than Toyota. You know what I mean? They can't. The whole world today depends on how efficient your production. And if you have machines doing most of the work, then the help has to be like computer programmers. And they all make recommendations. And they familiarize all the workers with every aspect of production. So they are generalists in the automobile production field, not in thinking. And their devotion to the company is like the mother. Without that mother, they'd have no jobs. And there's new organizations forming in Japan to try to counteract that. But that doesn't bring any money to Japan, so it won't be too successful. You can't counteract something unless you bring something new. They don't give many social services over there either, do they? They do have some. The new, the Japanese that have been laid off and those affiliated with goodwill and all that, to a limited extent. But Japan does not have the social services U.S. has yet. But when they get laid off, there is no future. There's nothing they can study unless they study computer programming, and they got a hell of a lot of computer programmers in Japan. Do you understand? The programmer operates the sequences, whereas the foreman used to do that. He used to say, the wheels come on, now they go to painting. Well, the computerized program does that. So the, the guy in charge used to be in the front office. Now the desk is right in the shop, next to the working man. So they, they dress like the working men, they wear the same clothing. And that's to make them feel that they're all one. So American engineers went to Japan to study their system. And they're installing it in America. 
That's what time and motion people are. They get more motion out of people in less time. So if you assemble certain things and you've got a straight assembly bench, if you bend it, all the parts are nearer. And so you can assemble things faster, but you don't get paid more. You know what I mean? So time and motion men are also engineers who try to get the most motion in the least amount of time out of most people. Now, their job is to get to do that. Their job is not to benefit people. See, now there should be psychologists study, study stress levels and stop at a certain point. That does not help the company. Do you understand? That's why they don't have psychological fatigue studies. But we would have that because that means more hospitalization. If you don't have fatigue studies, the company doesn't pay for it, the guy pays for it. So that's his problem. If he gets sick or a nervous breakdown, he has to go to a psychologist or a hospital. The company does not study that because it doesn't do them any good to find out what the level is. I think it would do them good, but they don't understand that. They, all they have is charts, production levels. If it goes up higher, whatever the production line is that's getting that high mark, called exponential curve, they try to put that on all levels, then Japanese companies do not share ideas with other Japanese companies. But they do welcome visits to their plant, and people make notes and walk away with the same thing. Now the supermarkets, I don't know if you notice this, they don't have all the cashiers working. They have certain aisles working. And they put more load on the girls, tabulator. And uh, they have new machines that measure the phone calls that the help makes while they're on the production line. If the phone call runs over a certain amount of time, it's noticed. It's printed out. So the executive managers of the supermarkets know how much time you spend on the phone, even though it's your family. And if you get more than four days off a year, they tend to can you. So when I say capitalism is inefficient, it hurts itself because the more people you lay off eventually, they won't have the money to pay taxes or buy the products. Do you understand what I'm saying? If you don't, you're supposed to interrupt me. So if I say capitalism was okay maybe a hundred years ago, we didn't have any other systems, but it's socially offensive today. People have higher stress levels, most normal people, because their company tries to get them to become, take their work home with them and think about it, you know. But you've been around a while, would you say Stress levels, if you think back... Even to amongst you, the you, executives. But let's say when you were a child, do you, do you think back and remember, did people have just as much stress then as they do now, or less? Well, they... Over the years, what's it... They have less because they weren't laid off as much. Today you work for a company, you get laid off, and you look for the same job again, and it's gone. Automation is being installed very quickly. And the rate that automation is being installed is going up like that. It isn't a slow, long curve. Now, if they build automation plants, you don't need heating in the winter because machines don't need that. Do you understand? When you've got humans working, you need heating and daylight and electric lamps. You don't need that with machines. You also have to give a little bit of insurance on the working people. You have to have a nurse and a first aid station. You don't need that with machines. So with machines, it's called lights out manufacturing. You know, the factory could be dark as long as it's automated. That's why human systems go on strike, they smoke, they go to the bathroom, they fuck off, which is all normal. But with machines, there's no fuck off. They work hard all the time and they make no demands. So if I say we're moving toward a machine world, 
It isn't a wish that I have, it's a natural direction of technology. An engineer's job is to tighten up systems, make things work better. So the engineers don't know that they're hurting other people. They say, well, why don't you become an engineer until they get laid off. Until you have a, like you have a monitor in a supermarket that works with a cashier, which I told you, they measure the time. If a person calls up and says, are you earning anything special on beans today? If they spend too much time on the phone, they're moved out. So they, their phone calls are monitored. And the more you know about people and their bank accounts, the more you know that we're going to have a good business here this Christmas if a lot of people have savings in the bank. So they monitor. Banks do monitor what you buy and how much you withdraw and how much you put back in. So the more banks know about you, and there's certain things they're not supposed to do that are against the law, but the lawyers have a way of saying, well, this, we want to know whether a person is an agitator, you know, or a communist. Or... So the more information you get on people, their savings, their habits, their hobbies, the more you know about them, the more you can predict. So I say what science is about is predictability. If you know if you go hunting Wednesdays, you're going to catch more deer than Sunday, because everybody's out there hunting on Sunday. You know what I mean? So if you keep a record of that, you have to do that for yourself in order to catch a deer. Does that make sense? If you share your ideas, always go Wednesday because it's least crowded. If a guy says, instead of taking Saturday off at work, I'm going to work Saturday, but I'm going to hunt Wednesday because there's more deer. You understand that? He doesn't tell everybody in the plant that because everybody would do that. Yeah. Self-interest hurts the majority of people, but it doesn't hurt the person that's involved in self-interest. That's why most people stick to what they know. Because when you tell them there's another way, it doesn't do anything for them right now. Do you understand that? That's why they're not interested. But if the system continues to lay off people, they're going to be forced to be interested. But let's say, it, I hope it's not too late, that, that the environment's so badly damaged and people are so badly laid off and so hungry, the robberies will go up. If you cut out the uh, support structure, if they can't get a job and you cut out the payments, then crime will go up. Whether they hit you on the head and take your wallet or break into your house. Now it's more efficient for criminals to work as a gang rather than you trying to rob a bank have one guy outside looking around, one guy setting a building on fire three miles from the bank that keeps the police occupied. You know what I mean? That's called strategy for bank robbing. Instead of you just going in with a gun saying, I want your money. The banks are now installing very heavy plate glass laminated so that even if you point a gun at the teller she has a foot pedal, she presses. That rings an alarm at the police station. That means it's a robbery underway. Now, they're not allowed to understand, install trap doors in front of the cashier. When she presses what you fall through the trap door. Because it might accidentally go off and they'll sue the shit out of the bank. They're not that accurate yet. But I can assure you when they are, they'll install them. And it becomes more difficult to become a criminal with all these cameras around the banks. Now, should the banks put the cameras in? Well, if they want to survive and don't want to be robbed every day, they have to do that. And their insurance is less. Do you want to know that? If you put fire sprinklers in hotels, your insurance is less. So people put them in, they don't put them in for your benefit. You've got to remember that if you get sentimentally attached to any system, including the one where you're an engineer and you make things faster, 
engineers do not concern themselves with working people. So luckily they were smart enough they'd be engineers. But until the engineers get laid off, that's why Veblen wrote a book called Engineers and the Price System. He explains what will happen to engineers. And he says that you are the guys that make everything happen. You ought to be in charge of society. But no engineer thinks that way. Except in the early days of technocracy, a lot of engineers joined. Because they knew by reading Veblen that eventually they will be replaced.